Hey folks. Uh, okay, we're ten oh two. So shall we dive into things? So I see. I, sorry, Justin, you say something. Yeah, I was asking if we should dive in and start to talk about things. Uh, well, let me turn my speaker up because I couldn't hear you. Um, I'm guessing that we have a small group because uh, while we talked about going from ten to eleven last week. Uh, and Amy did update the calendar that people are forgetting that we have 10 to 11 now. Um, so I'm uh, happy to start because I think um, I was just reading Marina's uh, tough document, which uh, there's just a couple epiphanies in there that I think uh, help with, I think, some of the confusion we've had in some of the conversations. Yeah, one thing um, I do want to mention is, is that um, even though Tuff has update in the name, that's the U in Tuff, um, it is also used for initial software installation lots and lots of times and places as well. So it's, um, you know, like um, regardless of what you're, what you're doing with it, whether you're doing a, an actual update of something where you've already established uh, like have an earlier version or whether you want to install uh, something new, uh, tough is meant to handle that case securely and well. So I, it was one of the things that I called out because I did pull up a couple of things and there's this one section for non goals that talks, uh, let me just put this here, not providing a means to bootstrap. Uh, what that means is, is that, um, so um, we're not going to prescribe whether you do some way of trust on first use or how you get like a, a bundle of things inside your client. In, in practice, um, what's always the best, if you know what repo you're gonna communicate with, which uh, register you're gonna communicate with, which maybe you do, then it's, it's always the best to just ship some version, even an old version of at least the root metadata for that, which is much smaller than, you know, for instance, your CA bundle will be for your root CAs anyway. Um, it's, you know, like, a, I don't know, maybe a kilobyte or something. So we want, um, basically what we want to say, our way of saying non-goals is to say, it isn't to say that that isn't at all a concern. It's to say that that's not something where we're doing something new and um, interesting and that different people that deploy this in different ways could very well elect to use different models as is true for different communities that use Tough today. 
Okay. Um, all right, I'm just looking at uh, I, I, the agenda and, um, oh yeah, thanks Niaz. We should add ourselves to as the attendees. Let me just post that here as well. Um, So um, for the first thing in general was the key management. And uh, Niaz, I'm wondering if we flip it because by the attendance, I'm guessing most folks didn't recognize the change from 10.30 to 10 a.m. start. Um, it might also be that we yeah. that agenda out until late, which I'm trying to get better about. Sorry, what were you saying? No, that makes sense to me. Um, I think uh, I just more had like announcements for people to look at things. Um, so it makes sense to wait till 1030. Okay. So, um, Justin Marina, do you want to do the metadata overhead conversation first? I mean, is that less important to have people here for? I, it's recorded and we at least have some people here. So I I'm open to suggestions. I'm just, I know that you know, this is the only person for the uh, the key stuff that I know others are also like participants in where I see you guys being the ones that are driving this conversation. So at least it's recorded up to you guys. Um, hold on. So I'm trying to figure out what else is on the agenda here. I mean, I, I guess like we can really quickly talk about it. Maybe the metadata discussion, there's not a lot of, um, perhaps there's there's not a lot of um, debate about it. Um, I don't know that we want to go through the numbers in any massive detail, but um, basically the spreadsheet we sent out shows the, the overheads and other things with this. Um, and the comparison page is really the only page you need to look at if you want to get the actual kind of um, uh, bird's eye view of what's going on. If you really want to dig into exactly how everything was computed, then the other sheets make some amount of difference. Um, and we also looked at what the sizes of different things are for um, a I think there's a typo here, but for a registry with a single image and a registry with uh, 200 million images, which is I think the size of Docker, Docker's registry is the second bit. Um, and in either case, the, the actual overhead numbers um, we show there, we color coded this to try to say what we thought um, like would make sense. Um, but of course, just left the numbers there. So if you have a large. Um, <clears throat> Can you back up and like, explain the methodology of what you're trying to do? Because this is the I'm just looking at this for the first time and I'm trying to follow. Oh, um, well, we're trying to see what the what the overhead would be in essence for going in and um, actually like uh, producing appropriately signed metadata and things that would allow you to verify um, that images haven't been, <clears throat> excuse me, that they haven't been, uh, the metadata hasn't been tampered with. You don't have old data being replayed and so on. Um, so in the end, what we did is we looked at, we, we got some numbers from Justin Cormack that were very helpful. Um, we also went and, uh, looked at sizes of things where we tried to go and look at what ex like existing systems would have or use in different scenarios, um, how much overhead that would be. And then, um, we took the proposal that that uh, we, I guess, called it the Alaska proposal because I don't know if that's perfectly accurate, but it, it, um, it's a, I think the, the solution that we've seen you present and talk about the most. So 
So we named it that because I, I think that just made it easier it, for us at least to keep track which was which. Um, and we compared the overheads of all of these in all the different scenarios to see kind of what um, the cost would be. And we talked in more detail about how these costs were derived, but basically the way we propose to set this up and um, the green options are the ones we think are good. Uh, the, the yellow options are the ones that we think are okay. Um, and the red options are the ones that we wouldn't recommend. Um, the red Another option. When you're saying you did, that's what I'm trying to understand. You're obviously a green is good, red is bad, and, but I'm not sure what you've done differently between them. So uh, the numbers here, okay, so there's, there's two things that we looked at here, but the main thing that this looks at is it looks at the, um, the actual size overhead of doing the transmissions of data. Um, we also, <clears throat> for this, uh, I can't highlight this well, for the fresh client option for tough design option two, <clears throat> it's, this is what a client that has no previous state is going to get, which is okay, but it's not great. So the reason why this is sort of yellow from, you know, yellow colored is from a security standpoint, um, you're not as, as well off as, as you would otherwise be. Um, that's also why this column here is is red because of the security concerns that we talked about um, over the past like many meetings um, related to not having some kind of snapshot uh, metadata. And then we did comparisons to look at really what we're trying to do here is to look at like what's the overhead of going and doing um, you know, the sort of signing and things like that and producing metadata you would need that would allow you to do the stronger security verification. So in, in both cases, um, we think the overheads are small, both for a single image and large public repo. And so the options that we ended up selecting here, because we view these overheads as negligible, um, we chose we would recommend the option that has the best security for um, for the users as, as a good option because something like a 0.002% overhead or a 0.04% overhead um, is feels like a drop in the bucket um, to pay for getting uh, you know improved security. I, um, I couple of comments here. Um, uh, one, uh, I think um, the clarification definitely helps. It was a little bit confusing to me because when I was looking at it from a signature overhead perspective, uh, it's not clear to me why some of these options are not recommended. Um, I think I would make that a call out in the doc that says these options are not recommended for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, and maybe in the doc, I'm just kind of looking at this really quickly, um, but that, that, that kind of just definitely does help um, that there's something in addition to the metadata overhead that we're looking at. Uh, the other question I have, um, and this is something where I'm not familiar enough with registries, uh, but uh, are there other uh, overheads that we should also look at in terms of like the time to pull down signatures and compute them uh, that should also be included in this overhead? Yeah, we can certainly add things like that. Um, in practice, we haven't found that to be problematic. I mean, even a, like, you know, even the little embedded systems that people use in automobiles, um, that you know, the signature, like doing a couple of signature verifications, isn't a big deal for an ECU. And the the real expensive thing here is the. Um, is, is like, you know, would be something like a private key signing, which, you know, even then you do uh, tens of thousands per second, um, doing verifications substantially faster than that. And if you're doing something like, um, which I, I don't think you're doing, um, we'll be doing anything more complicated, but, but you know, the, the actual time overhead here is, you know, think of it like, um, um, you know, like, like TLS or something like that. It just, it, it really gets kind of lost in that, um, at least in practice has, has always been sort of lost in the, 
in, in you know in the sea of other things. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Sorry, go ahead. Right, yes. So I was going to say what we've usually done in the past uh, is just compare that to the time it would take to deploy an artifact without a signature versus time to deploy with. Uh, and that, like, you know, if we consider other options down the road, uh, I think the distinction here would help call out why CUF might be a better solution, right? Like if the implementation from the top side just adds very little versus sort of like some other signature validation uh, adds significantly more validation time. I think that's a good data point to have in the future as well. Yeah, we, we can take a look at this, um, but in practice, it, it's going to be extremely minimal. And, and even just the, um, like the, you know, the signatures from like the, the, on the metadata from the Lasker proposal will already be um, it, it's like similar to what we have, which is in both cases going to be like just kind of lost in the noise unless you're on a, a 10 gig Ethernet uh, downloading full bore or something, then maybe it, it, you know, it does make some very minor percentage wise difference, but in terms of absolute time, it's, it just shouldn't really matter. Yeah, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of curious about, um, like, you know, when I think about signature verification, like you're recomputing the hash of the bits that you just downloaded, right? Um, and that should take some time. Um, so I'm kind of curious as to why there isn't an impact here. Uh, maybe there's something I'm missing in how the signature validation is happening. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you're, um... Yeah, number one, like as you would download it, you'd usually compute that. But even if you if you don't, um, in terms of actual crypto operations, you can do um, like uh, many many. I think I, I I'll run the the numbers. You can do open SSL speed um, on this, but but doing like uh, secure hashing over data is extraordinarily fast. On a modern computer, so uh, it's just not. Um, I I don't know. It, it's not something that um, that we've we've had really a concern with anybody who's deployed or tried it in practice. Um, but we can we can get some numbers for you. It, it's just like um, I mean, you you do all these things too when you do a download um, over HTTPS. So, um, you know, if you're, you're going to see something like that slowdown, which is, is imperceptible. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we can, we can look at it, but um, like in practice, what we've seen is latency and bandwidth are a mu much bigger contributors to this. Now, if you're in a data center and you have a huge bandwidth and you're, you know, you're serving things from the same rack, then you're right that that may not matter as much, but it's it's still not going to be a, an expensive operation in terms of absolute time. I, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly you're comparing here. I mean, because the the methodology it's not clear to me what methodology or even what problem you're trying to solve here, because We've done a great job saying, yes, this one is red, it must be bad, and this one's green, it must be good. And there's numbers, but there's nothing really explaining what it is you're trying to accomplish. If I'm taking a image and I'm trying to get its signature back, then I'm not sure why, what you're trying to say by how much content is in a registry and how it affects that performance. So the, the other design document we have has like outlined some of the security problems and shortcomings with the proposal of just retrieving a signature. This notion of like something is signed, therefore I trust it is, is mm -hmm. problematic. Um, and so what we've done here is this document is focused on what's the overhead 
that is, you know, that you would have if you actually provide protection that's greater than just having something that has a signature somewhere that may or may not be out of date. And but so I think you're making a leap as to that the problem you're trying to solve is a problem we need to solve. Like I, you're, that's what I'm trying to track. And that's what I was referring to earlier of the, a registry has two categories of content. There's content that is, you know, software and base images that other people depend on. And they are intentionally a single version, a tag that references it as a version. And we do want to get updates to that. Um, and we've built stuff in Azure specifically to enable getting updates to that, not, not from a security perspective, just a notification that an update has happened. The, the digest has changed for a given tag. So that's an important problem for base images, you know, like uh, uh, operating systems like Linux and Windows and the various permutations of each and so forth and the runtimes that are sitting on top of them. But when customers build something from that, um, they don't want an update to that thing because the, an update to that thing that they're building is a specific deployment. They want a secure supply chain that's uh, not a secure supply. They want a supply chain that says something changed, might be the source itself that changed, that I, I made an update and I want to push that, or the thing I depend on changed and I want an update from that. So I think we have to tease out the two because the, the apps that people built should not get updated tags that there would be any update specific to that. So I think we're just mer that merging the two, which isn't really the problem. Uh, I, I, I think that people that want to have what the updated tag points to should get what the updated tag points to. And people that want to have a version should get a version, a specific version. I think, think we agree on that. And I think we also agree that it would be bad if, um, if a potentially malicious actor could give somebody that said they wanted the latest version, an old version that has security vulnerabilities or other things like that. I think we're, we're in agreement about that. And so um, the, the problem is that the design that just does the signatures with no context and no snapshot as we, as we call it in this document, that, that design doesn't provide that set of protections. Um, for all the reasons we talk about in the other document that we go through the um, the uh, the Google Doc, not the spreadsheet. And so what what we presented here, you know, we also went through and wrote up the other Google Doc that walks through all the scenarios and shows how the design that has these security properties actually works in all the scenarios. And now we've gone and we've shown that it's actually efficient, at least what we feel is efficient um, in these scenarios. And so we're, we're, you know, trying to show that the added security you get from doing things this way um, doesn't come at the cost of usability, doesn't come at the cost of overhead um, and so on. And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to present this in as clean of a way as we can so that others can, can look at this and then, um, you know, like um, get the the protection that they should have for their users. Because the last thing that, that we want is for there to be a security um, incident and to have uh, users at substantial risk because, um, you know, we, we decided not to add a protection for whatever reason. So help me with, if, I a, think if the concern is the registry is trying to be protected from being hacked to roll it back to an older version, why wouldn't they hack this metadata store as well? So um, you, they would hack what? They would hack? The, what well, if this metadata store that you're saying has this authoritative um, complete view? Like if, right. I think one of the things you're saying we're trying to protect from is I have the Monday's build on Monday it was fine, but on Wednesday we discover it was insecure. And on Friday, a new version is pushed. So how do we keep, and we want, if that tag, Ubuntu 1404, whatever, um, is hacked, that if there's a 1405 on Friday release that somebody doesn't point it back to 1404, which is still valid, 
but it's, it is known to be less secure than the one that was shipped on Friday. If right. A, yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of ways that this happens. So first of all, um, for clients that have any prior state who have seen anything in the past, um, then what happens is, is that a client has historical information from the last time they've seen things. But, what, but the, you're assuming the, that the client is a steady state, like we're targeting a serverless environment where the, their clients are, don't have any knowledge of the previous state every yeah, time. So, every time it's a so, neutral, it's a restart. So, so I, I was, I, I preface what I was saying by saying, so in the case that the clients have state, okay, then, then there's this protection. Okay. So in the case that the clients do not have state, then there are a few means to deal with this. So presumably they have, they have the root metadata or something else from that uh, registry that they're going to that tells them like what the correct snapshot key is. Okay, so presuming they have this, then what you or what anyone as a registry operator does is once a day, you securely sign a new snapshot file. Okay, so basically you take the updated um, in design option two here, you take the updated um, targets files over that period, you generate a new Merkle tree for it, and you push the resulting metadata out. Okay, so this is it's something a tree of what of everything in that one repo. Yeah, it's a Merkle tree of what's in the repo. Okay, and what we show here with the numbers and things is is that, um, you know, even though the absolute data is modestly large, it's not actually that large in in registry terms or you know like real terms. It's it's um, you know it it's um you get the data and the data clients download is small because they only need to download their path to the Merkle tree. Um, are you, what I'm confused though is it's 200 million. Are you, are you saying it's the entire registry or just that one repo? Like the Ubuntu repo. You can do the entire registry. Um, you can do all the public parts of the registry. You can even uh, intermingle private and public. It scales very well. But it's not a matter of scaling. It's a matter of like each repo is itself different, right? Like Windows and Ubuntu are, well, they're not, but it's just Alpine and Debian are in the same registry, um, but there's no correlation between the two. Yeah, um, but the idea is, is that you want versioning information, other things like that to be updated consistently. If, yeah. if people have state. So it doesn't hurt you to have it all in one repo is a large part or not repo, but in one um, repo is not the right term, for, but to, to have all the repositories inside of the registry is, is I think your way of thinking about it. All be all share a snapshot file. Well, that's what I'm here to suggest. And that's what I'm trying to understand. Is that what you're suggesting or? Yeah, that's what design option two does is it shows that you can actually put, so design option one shows um, like what happens if you just make private registries that are all small or you segment things up some way. Which and, is what people do because there's different owners of each one. So that's why I'm, I'm struggling because the, one of the options that we keep on talking about is putting everything together, but we haven't addressed any of the security issues where those are fundamentally different owners and teams that they're, and we have, depending on the registry and how they're implemented, have challenges of how we support that. Yeah, we talk about that in the document um, quite a bit. If there's, if there's parts that are in there that aren't clear or need more exp exposition, we can always do more. But um, this, this is something, you know, like the way to think about it is um, if you imagine for a moment, you have all these separate repos, which is fine. Just think mm -hmm. of it that way, okay? They're all totally separate. Now think for a moment, um, what if you could like link everybody's snapshot to everybody else's snapshot together? Not targets, not linking other things. Then, then that would strictly be better than having all right. of the- I think there's an assumption that you're making and that's why I don't understand why you're making that leap. Um, because the way in which you do, um, okay. 
So let, let's walk through the example in the document that we wrote uh, before. In, this, in the notary V2 signature design proposal. Um, I'm trying to find it, hold on a second, please. Um, just really quickly before we move to that, I think um, what we're essentially having is a conversation around the design itself, right? I think the metadata doc um, could easily circumvent that by just calling out what makes sense from a metadata perspective. Um, because I think the, the conversation we're looking more at is does this design actually work or not? And there's a lot of other considerations we're taking in there. Um, but this doc on its own from a size perspective just can call out what are the options that make sense or not, right? I think it's saying a lot more about options without really covering uh, the content of like what those decisions are, which is called out in a different doc. And I think, you know, just separating out what the recommendation here is uh, based on size versus we look at the, the other doc, I think would make more sense just for keeping context. Thanks, Nils. Yeah, I, I think here's the thing, Justin, I, the, the, what I, what you've got me labeled as me, you know, is some snapshot, no snapshot proposal. All, all I'm saying there is there is a way to go find content using this reverse lookup. So it, it's not excluding any metadata um, conversation. So, I don't, so to label one bad versus the other, that's what I'm just trying to understand what it is you're trying to say. The, the concerns we've had is not that you is a registry, especially Docker Hub, which is meant for the world to put content on, is intentionally segmented. And then you have private registries that even though they're private to a, a particular customer, they still have multiple teams sharing content in that. Um, so how do we uh, account for a set of doc, a set of content that needs to be secured. The first is just, is it signed? And then you have a second level of security, which we're not pushing back on that it's not valid. It's just where, what is the trade-off of it that um, an update can be somehow verified? So I think it's just, it goes back to the scenarios. Which scenarios are we trying to account for here? Yeah, and I think so the, the main goal of this is just to show the feasibility of adding, in addition to just signatures, if you add this, um, this second level of repository security, the, the, just the main idea is that it doesn't add so much extra um, metadata for the client to download that it's like infeasible for them to do it. That's kind of the, the main idea. And then, you know, you can dig into the numbers and figure out, you know, exactly how much extra is it and what does that mean but i think that's the, the big takeaway okay i'm just looking at the i i got i was reading through the tough doc where i didn't get to this uh this other diplomat using delegations so i hadn't finished reading that one And did, does this talk about, is this theoretical in how you did the measurement or did you actually perform this operation on Docker Hub? Um, it's, it's partly theoretical, partly, I, I generated some metadata locally to test sizes, but um, yeah, I didn't actually like upload things and stuff, so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to get all the signed data everywhere from Docker Hub to do it for real, but we took the, we took actual numbers uh, like image sizes and things from Docker Hub and looked at like looked at actual stuff there to do the estimates, which we expect to be right within a factor of, you know, like maybe maybe two, something like that. Could be slightly larger, could be slightly smaller, but it's not gonna be um substantially off and the growth rate is is about right. So um it's I, I may be giving Marina not enough credit. I think her numbers are a lot more right than that. But um, as as like new interesting cases or things like that, like emerge if there's some weird, um, trying to think of even what this would be. But um, if somebody is scattering massive amounts of small OCI metadata or something like that, then maybe, um, 
you know, maybe that like uh, changes one of the terms in the spreadsheet slightly. Um, but in general, we did, I think, a, a pretty, um, we tried to be very thorough about this so that it, it was a really fair comparison and it was really factually based on the information we got. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, one of the things we can look at, I mean, the, the prototyping that we're looking at doing will, should be able to give the opportunity to be able to put this information. I think the, the biggest problem or the biggest concern, and if you're saying that this doc talks about it, then we, you know, we can certainly address it. But the biggest concern is how do we as registry operators secure any content across different repos? Because by definition, there should be no, uh, team A should not have access to team B's information, um, especially if it's not public. So the shared, any shared information between them is a concern uh, from a right. security perspective. So, right. um, so, so let, me, let me just talk about that real quick because that's come up a couple of times. Um, the kind of TLDR is, uh, already you have mechanisms that protect like the different repositories on the same system from this, like on, on the same registry. So you, you already have all kinds of access control for this. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you can view this snapshot as just being extra like uh, uh, metadata that happens to be the same for every repository, but nothing else, none of the other files change. Okay. And then there's one other property of this metadata that is important, which is that um, I, if, if I give you like your path to the root of the Merkle tree, you have no idea and no way to prove that anything else is in that Merkle tree. So like, basically it's not that you can't just go like poking around and looking at things because of the way that the you do the secure basically you're given the secure hash of things and you'd have to be able to go backwards from the secure hash to be able to get any meaningful information about what anybody else is doing and the whole reason why secure hashes are secure is because you can't go backwards from the hash to find the original thing no it's not a matter i'm not are you saying that the if i had if team B had access to team A's secured hashes, they couldn't recreate the actual content. I think that's what, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. But the question is how did team B even get access to team A's metadata in the first place and why? Okay, um, let's, uh, it, it isn't that they get access to their metadata. They don't have their metadata. What they have is when you sign something. Okay, so, so think of it, um, it, it's like you're doing one signature on the registry and that one signature has a whole bunch of secure hashes listed under it. And it doesn't, you don't know who those hashes are for or what those hashes mean or anything. What you're told is, is that if your hash is there, then, then the thing was signed by the registry. Right. And so it doesn't matter what those other things are. It's, they're just, they're just hashes. Right. That's effectively what like um, what like a completely flat Merkle tree would look like, which would be really inefficient. And there wouldn't be a reason to do it. But you can you can see um, I think you can see conceptually why the security property, the privacy property you have, you get it there. Um, and in fact, the inside the document. Um, there's there's a description about how even. If, oh, sorry. Did somebody else want to say something? Okay, um, even if you like knew the person you were next to somehow in the tree, like you were at a company and you had the pre previous metadata and you went and knew that this hash corresponded somehow to this party, um, when you generate the new thing, you can just put the, like the timestamp of the thing you're doing in that secure hash and it makes it so that everything moves randomly in the tree anyway. 
because you're you're adding an extra piece of information into every to the secure hashes you're doing. And so it really doesn't. Um, it, it's one of these things that sounds more complicated than it is. It's it's actually really um, really simple, um, but it's uh, it, it's just a way to do this and store this information so that there isn't like a, uh, you know like a, um, a, a privacy leak between parties. Yeah, if it can held. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Trisha. Yeah, sorry. If it if it helps, Steve, I was also pressing uh, Justin and Marina for a bit more details on how this would preserve privacy. So, so let me try to see if I can use different words to try to assuage your concerns. What Justin is saying is correct. The Merkle tree is it's got a whole bunch of leaves under it, billions of leaves, whatever it is. And and the point is, unless you know what you're looking for, the key in the in the in the tree, you're not even going to know that it exists. Right, so that's the thing you should be worried about. What if I knew the key? I think is the question. Right? Yeah. So, so what if you knew the key? What if you could guess, for example? Oh, I know that Microsoft is working. Maybe I know the code name of this project. I'm going to try to query this key and see if it exists in the tree. Right. That's the larger concern here, and I ran through this with them. And so the way the thing that needs to be hidden. So the snapshot has got all these leaves in there, that's for sure. And if you knew the key, you could try to guess and and query the the the, the snapshot for it. And so what you need to do is to obfuscate. You need to hide the 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 key names. That's the more important thing. And the way you would do this is by using existing access control mechanisms you already have for private images. If you don't know, if you don't have permission to to see the key, you won't you you won't be able to query it in the first place. Now, if you knew the key, for example, if you could somehow guess it, and you could guess the you could guess the you could query the snapshot for it. And the way to solve that problem is by uh, obfuscating your your true things. You don't you don't want to give away. You don't want to use the direct code name, for example. Maybe use something else. Does that make sense? Well, what I'm and maybe I'm just not hearing it right. But what I'm hearing you're saying is if I've gotten this secure information, that there's no way to decode what the source was. Is that kind of the argument? Uh, if I give you a secure hash, you can't find, I mean, and you don't know what the answer is for some other reason, then there's no, it's infeasible, computationally infeasible for you to find something that matches that secure hash. No, I gotta put, okay. So that is the proposal. So now what I'm asking is how, what is it you're expecting like the two teams using the same same registry especially if they're private don't have what you're kind of making your argument is team b even if it got team a's secure metadata that they can't reverse engineer anything so it doesn't expose anything the fact that there's even metadata that you got access to from team a is is this the security boundary problem so I get that. But you don't get access to the metadata. You get you get a secure hash of something. But why do you have access to anything, a secure hash or anything of across two private entities? Um, because if you want to link everything together in in a way that you have time timely information, like um, what's the way to say this? If you want to have actual um, you know, the ability to say that things weren't modified, you have to have some notion of like a snapshot of information on the repository. You have to have some notion of, of like time moving forward. Otherwise, you're always in like, um, like this perpetual state of, um, you know, this like this baby bird imprint on whatever random thing you happen to be given which is, is bad. Um, so what I, we- I think you keep on saying it that, but I'm not, I'm still trying to follow the, the use case. So if, if A entity is trying to pull content from both team A and team B, then I could see kind of like there's an efficiency here that I, when I try to validate both A and B's content, that I want to be efficient about that. Is that, is that the argument? Not necessarily, no. So it if isn't. I'm just team oh, A and I never look at team B and team B never looks at team yeah. A, 
what is the benefit to this disclosure of information between the two just for us, the, the security aspect? Um, what you want to have is you want to have like a, um, um, you want to have like effectively like a historical record of what's occurred at different time periods. And the more that you link into this historical record, the, the better it is because the more like the problem with having separate historical records for every party is, is that it's easier to go through and for an attacker to then replay whatever things they want out of there in, in like a, a different way. So um, to go to the example in the document, which is, I think you have this up now. So uh, figure one looks at what happens when you have per image index manifest signatures here. Okay. Um, and the example it's giving is this is an example where in this case, there happens to be um, a repository that contains things both from uh, uh, foo and var. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, tr and then, wanna, I'm trying to figure out which diagram you're pointing at. Uh, figure one in, in the notary v2 signature design document. Oh, there's okay. Right. Um, so the idea here is that an attacker goes, um, they're going to go and they're going to break in and they get access to, um, you know, uh, basically they are going to be able to go and manipulate what a party that goes to this registry looks at. So if you go um, and look here, you'll see that there's a version that's colored in red for each foo and for bar. Um, uh, it has, I must be looking at the wrong one. Hold on a second. Which document are you referring to? Because I see, I'm looking at your diplomat use delegations, which you're talking about a different document. Okay, I think I found it. The one that Marina put in the Excel spreadsheet now. Yeah, so um, if you look here at figure one, mm -hmm. all right, so here you go and you have um, per image index manifest signatures, you basically have no um, snapshot information here. So what happens is um, here you have this this repository, it had at, at, on Tuesday, a bad version of foo was pushed. It's not known that this was a bad version at the time, of course. Um, Wednesday, this was maybe discovered that, hey, there's some um, security issue or something with this. And so now foo one point latest on Wednesday points to foo 1.2, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, Thursday, similarly, bar is uh, bar 1.2 is released, it has problems. And then Friday bar 1.3 is released to fix that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now um, skip down a little bit here and there's a table. Mm -hmm. You can just look it's at the top half. Figure, it's not figure two, you're saying there's a... There's a table, I'll, I'll come back. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, I'm, I don't know what page this is, but okay. Yeah, so, and then at the top here, um, if an attacker goes and uh, compromises the, um, the uh, registry, then the question is, is that what damage um, can they do to a specific client? Like what metadata can they give to the client to make them think a certain version is um, like is the latest version? This is for a client that's trying to retrieve do one point latest or bar one point latest. So because the registry gets to pick what who or bar points to, then if they're just retrieving the per image information, then the registry gets to go and just basically um, uh, like pick whatever vulnerable version they want to, to have be installed. 
And the client, because it doesn't have any notion of what version, like bar or foo or like, you know, what history of any of these tags are or how they happened or what's going on has no way to protect themselves in that case. Um, so now if we go back, it, well, first of all, is that clear? I, the client, it's a new client every time. So the client just simply was told, I need one, uh, foo one. Well, in, in this case, um, once again, the client is going to get some metadata. Now this, as I said, could be loaded onto the client. Like the client somehow gets the root metadata or whatever else. It, that's not a feasible thing in any kind of ephemeral environment. That every node, every compute that's given to it is this serverless environment that has no knowledge of what customer it's being used for, what registry it might be pulling from. So it is as vanilla as it possibly can be. Right, but it at least has information. It, it has no information about any registry it might pull to. Correct. It, do, it does today because it has to know at least like I might want to go like here's the um, CA bundle for Docker, you know, that, that is going to let me establish trust and first use with Docker Hub or whatever. It, what, uh, I think we're mixing a couple of scenarios and you know, as I just, I just noticed the time and I, that kind of, but the scenario you have to account for is that uh, a, a serverless environment, right? There's just the, uh, Azure, AWS, Google, whatever. We've got VMs that are sitting around and, and compute instances that were just ready to give out to any one customer at any one time. The majority of customers don't actually pull their content that they're deploying from Docker Hub. They pull it from their private registry. And as we give that, VM to you know any one of the hundreds of thousands to millions of customers that we have, we have no idea what registry they're going to pull from. So that compute is instanced to them in um, no knowledge around which registry it's going to pull from. Um, so it, how do they do trust on first use? They use the uh, X509 certificate, or what, what do they do for, how do they get their like the keys yeah. that they can say it's valid? Yeah. There, there is a bundling process that happens prior to the environment bootstrapping. At least we need to do that. So um, there is only a valid set of hosts that you will be able to pull from, not any host on the internet, unless you have some kind of bundling or, or uh, exclusion or inclusion parts that have been set up from the CA as well. Yeah, not to right. mention that, sorry. Okay. I, was just, I was just gonna say this bundling process is where you effectively put this information in. You put the root file, just like, you know, where you get your stuff from, you yep. stick it in there. Yeah, so, so I can see you would have to give it the, you know, the, the current thinking is that you would obviously give it the client keys, you know, the, the public keys that says, these are the ones that I trust and um, it then was pulled. So what is your proposal that it's somehow in addition to the client keys, it gives it the public keys rather, it gives it some metadata as well? Yeah, so um, basically if you're able to give the keys, what tough uh, root metadata is, is it's basically just keys. It's keys with a, a little bit of information about what those keys do. So you give it those keys and you give it a snapshot file and you're off to the races. Yeah, I mean, and in practice, Go ahead, go ahead, Trishank. And in practice, you probably want to add a caching policy anyway. You don't want to keep pulling the same thing over and over again. So this is not a this is not the biggest concern, I think, like adding a caching layer where you can keep the previous snapshot that you saw, the Merkle tree, I mean. There is also another approach to address this in terms of like, and if you manage revocations for uh, um, artifacts that you no longer trust, um, is that also a design option we've looked at? Uh, well, Tuff tends to handle that for you. When you generate targets metadata, if you no longer want to trust an item, what you do is you just remove it from your targets metadata, and then it's no longer signed and available when once you upload the new version. So like kind of this deletion of trust is also a big problem, although not not one that we called out really specifically with having like detached signatures. 
like a separate, so, separate image. Right. Wouldn't that be a better solution? Because not only do you want someone that's getting foo one dot latest not to get foo one dot one, uh, but someone that's also directly trying to get foo one dot one to know that that signature itself is also invalid. Yeah, if you you can do that. Um, in fact, in the example here, uh, imagine that you want uh, foo one point one to no longer be addressable, even as foo one point one, right? then on Wednesday or Thursday, or whenever you realize that, you just remove that entry from the file as well in, in figure two, and it's gone. Um, if it's in figure one, then the malicious uh, registry can still just re-add that file or, or just keep it around. And you don't have any way to actually like invalidate it in a, in a good way. Um, so the, the thing with figure two is that as long as you've seen a snapshot from after the change was made, sorry, sorry, I, you know, I, I can go through this. I don't have to go through this now. And I, I do realize that Niaz, like you had something you wanted to mention too. And we've kind of co-opted this whole meeting. Um, do we want to spend an hour going through this stock later this week? Yeah, I think that the, and this might, so, uh, let me, I'll, I'll say this and let's figure out what we want to do. I, I think part of what we're doing here is we're saying there's this entity that there's almost like these two parties. It's the two sub key thing that both have to be done at the same time to agree. And part of the, and, and in fact, the original notary design actually had a separate store as well. Maybe that's why this was. But if you take an environment that says it has to be clean every time because we don't know who it is, but you have to put something on it so that it knows what to pull. The thought is, is that, and I don't know the details yet because that's what I'm looking for not Yaz and the other key folks to help with, is that client pulls the client keys from some other entity, not from the registry, some secure key management store. And then it has the ability to pull from the registry because it says, okay, I have these keys. It sounds like there's unless the metadata is also stored in a separate entity that is separately trusted, then if I, if that client then pulls from the registry at that point, it's not clear to me why whatever got hacked to push it back to a previous, the one, one tag instead of one, two, how that's any, basically it's going to, the, the hacker is going to hack that as well. So there's almost like this two, two phase commit thing that we're trying to achieve and where does that second piece of information come from? Yeah, if you're able to push keys, you're able to like, you're able to push tough root metadata or snapshot metadata. It's like the snapshot, like the thing you need for snapshot in design option two is, is just a, it's a, um, uh, what would it be? A 32 byte value. Yeah, I don't think uh, it's the, the size or anything. It's just, where does it come from that it's, there's a time, uh, there's a, an assumption around yeah. what's around for how long and when, and where does that information come from? I think yeah, that's we want to have a conversation. We can walk you through all this. It's not a problem. Um, we can walk anybody who's interested through this. It's totally fine. Um, yeah, and if we want to do this sometime later this week, that's great. I know other people probably have stuff coming up in a moment too. Is there stuff that we, and, and I actually have to drop in a moment. Um, I just realized I, I do actually have a hard stop. Um, but yeah, I apologize. I feel like I've talked an awful lot uh, during this meeting. Um, is there anything else we want to cover? Yeah, as you want to do your quick of what you had uh, proposed, I, I saw your PR, I gave you some comments on it. Was there some more that you wanted to talk about? Uh, yeah, I can address those. So I, what I put in is questions that I expect that we'll get uh, use cases to kind of clarify, like what, how these questions should be. And so the uh, the guidance, the, the, the feedback that you have should be addressed after the next meeting we have, where we go through the different use cases and see what we need to answer there. Um, I did want to check, like uh, I'm not sure what time zones everyone is. Um, I went with sort of like you know early morning availability I had because I figure that would be easier for East Coast and uh, for people dialing in from Europe. Uh, but if those slots that I have put in don't work for anyone, uh, just message me on Slack and I'll update it. Did you post something on Slack for when you uh, I put I put it in the meeting agenda. There's a doodle link there to pick uh, meeting times. Um, so uh, once I get feedback in from everyone, I'll go ahead and schedule some time. 
Okay, maybe it was just me, but I don't. I didn't realize it was. It was uh, yeah, I if you could conversation. Yeah, if you could post it to Slack, I think that would be very helpful too. Uh, I'll go ahead and I will paste it into Slack right now. Thank you. Oh, the doodle link was in the agenda. I got you. Yeah, just doing both would help people. I think people look at the agenda for what's currently got been the conversation thread and uh, Slack would be helpful for everybody. All right. Uh, so that's, we're at the hour. Um, I, I know it's, there's a lot of stuff there, but I think we are getting a little, at least I'm trying to understand a little bit better of what we're trying to accomplish. I don't know if the new environment was new information that helped understand where some of the concerns are coming from in addition to the cross repo thing. So um, we'll keep on iterating. I'll, I've started putting out a, a, a scope for, uh, I didn't put it out really yet in breath, is uh, how to, a, a framework for doing some prototyping so we can flush out some of these things um, I got some of it done last week. I'll be working on it this week. I'll get it out before the next meeting so people can take a look at it. And um, that hopefully will give us the framework to start experimenting with these things um, and flushing out the details. So with that, I encourage to take a look at Nia's schedule for whatever he's doing around key management that I know we need. And I'll, Niaz, I'll forward it to our internal key folks as well um, so they know that some specific content on that topic is coming up and uh, we'll keep the conversation going for the week and we'll meet next week. It is an hour now every week. I did uh, update that. Thanks folks. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Yeah.